So we've done so far in our series on cardiovascular critical care and emergencies, we've covered acute MI, we've covered emergency tachyarrhythmias, we did a little bit about aortic stenosis, and today we're going to go back to rhythm and talk about arrhythmias and then do some ECG practice together, okay? So in order to learn about the arrhythmias, first we have to think about the electrical conduction system of the heart. And you guys know this, but it's helpful to think about this whenever you're trying to understand what the surface ECG is trying to tell you. So we have the SA node, the sinus node. This is where your sinus beat originates from. These are cells that have automaticity, meaning that they depolarize on their own with no um, extrinsic input. So just on their own, they're depolarizing. They depolarize, and it's an impulse through the atrium to the AV node, atrioventricular node. What is the main function of this AV node? Anybody know? That's right. Yes, that was awesome, good catch. So that is to basically slow the impulse. So the AV slows what comes through the sinus node. And when you have the difference between your sinus depolarization, it causes a P wave, right? So sinus fires, P wave in the atria, then the AV node delays it. That's what happens, your PR interval is because of your AV node delaying things. So anything that changes your PR interval is probably gonna be the responsibility of the AV node. And then after the delay from the AV node, then the electrical input gets sent it down. Here's a bundle of His. This is the His Purkinje system. Here's your right bundle and your left bundle, which does have anterior and posterior fascicles, but you don't need to worry about that. <clears throat> As, so when you depolarize from this AV node, it also collects all of the electricity into one spot and sends it down the super highway. So these fibers can conduct very fast. As compared to muscle cells or myocytes, how quickly can they depolarize? Not so fast, right? So if you have electricity going through this system, it's fast. Fast uh, on an ECG correlates with narrow because it's all about time, right? So if things are happening quickly, then your impulse will either be short or narrow. So a QRS, or a ventricular depolarization, that goes through the His Purkinje system is nice and narrow. What is the maximum width for a normal QRS? Before you call it prolonged. 120, somebody said here comes the candy, whoa! Okay, <laughs> I told you I'm really bad at this, so it'll be fun. So 120 milliseconds if it goes through here. Now, if your impulse has to travel, either because you blocked one of these bundles, so it has to travel from myocyte to myocyte, or if it's originating somewhere in here, like in VT, right, then is it gonna be narrow or is it gonna be wide? It's gonna be wide, and why is it wide? Because it's not going on the freeway, it's going on the surface streets. So this is your freeway, okay, and these are your surface streets. Does that make sense to everybody? Great. So when you think about radiate arrhythmia, you gotta keep this anatomy in mind because you're trying to figure out what is happening at which stage in the electrical anatomy of the heart. But when you're trying to figure out how should I treat this Brady arrhythmia, there's really only two main things to consider in the acute setting. What's the most important thing in figuring out whether you should act on a Brady arrhythmia or just let it be? Symptoms, symptoms. there you go. Oh. So symptoms is the most important thing. If they're not symptomatic, you have some time to like think and figure it out. The other uh, criteria that we use to think about how urgently we act on brain arrhythmias is whether they have the potential to deteriorate. And in general, the more of this highway that's under construction, if you will, or blocked, the more potential you have to deteriorate. And the lower down in this system that things are originating, the worse that it is, because conduction is gonna be unreliable the further that you get away from going through the superhighway. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about wide versus narrow, where is the block, how bad is the block. So let's try an ECG. What does this ECG show? Just rhythm is the main thing I want you to focus on here. No. Sinus Brady, I saw you. Whoa, sorry, or you, you can hand it to the guy behind you. Okay. So this is sinus bradycardia, pretty simple, right? So you have two ways. To know that you have a P wave that's coming from the sinus node, it should be upright in lead two, and then upright sometimes biphasic in V1, depending on atrial size. But upright in lead two is a pretty good indication that this is a sinus P wave. 
If you see a P-wave morphology, hint, hint, that does not look normal to you, so it's negative in 2 or it's really large in V1, that might indicate that it's not coming from the sinus node. This is just a road map, and the way that it looks in 2, if it's upright, that's a sinus impulse. So this is just sinus bradycardia. So the heart rate here is at 350, 100, 75, 60, 50, 45, it's about 40. <clears throat> what do you do? Hey, heart rate of 40, doctor. What do you do for this? Good, so ask a question. So the first thing, if, an, if you get called from a nurse, patient has a heart rate of 40, that could be fine, that could be terrible. So what do you ask for when you get a call, heart rate of 40? Good, who said that? Blood pressure, ooh, that was left-handed, yes. Okay, so ask for a blood pressure while you're on your way. What else do you ask for? Good, who said that? That's not gonna happen, okay. Symptoms, so are they having any symptoms, such as, you gotta be more specific than that. Lightheadedness, dizziness, did they pass out, shortness of breath, so sometimes if your cardiac output, what is cardiac output, how do you determine that, what equation? Stroke volume times heart rate. All of you said that, so no one gets handy. So if your heart rate goes down, your cardiac output can go down significantly. So you could actually go into pulmonary edema, or you could even get sort of hypotensive borderline cardiogenic shock because your cardiac output goes down. So good, asking about those things. And then there's one more thing you should ask for while you're on your way to the bedside to evaluate the patient. 12 lead, you are on fire. 12 lead ECG, because you've got to know what this rhythm is. Not all heart rates of 40 are the same. Okay, good. Sign of bradyarrhythmia, you got it. So now let's talk about other types of bradyarrhythmia. So we started the sinus node. Now we're going to go down to the AV node and talk about how that can be impacted. So what is first degree AV block? What's the definition of first degree AV block? PR interval more than 200. PR interval more than 200. Well, you get that because you're sitting there with a nice necklace. Okay, so <laughs> PR interval greater than 200 milliseconds. That is first degree AV block. Happens all the time. Okay, second degree AV block, here's where terminology gets mixed up. So second degree AV block in and of itself implies that you have dropped beats. And dropped beats means that your sinus node fired and the conduction went down to the AV node and it didn't make it past the AV node. So second degree AV block has to have a P wave without an associated QRS. But there's two types of second degree AV block. What is Mobitz 1? What does that mean? Wanky Bob, good. What does that mean? That's right. So it's pretty simple. You have a warning. So the PR gets longer and longer and longer, and then it drops. So the way I remember this in terms of the order of, I'm going to give you this, but it's probably not going to make it. Yep. Um, so the way that I remember how bad they are, Mobitz 1 or Wanky Bach, you have a warning sign. So because there's a warning on the ECG, I don't get as worried about it. That's not actually electrophysiologically correct, but the truth is that Mobitz 1 generally doesn't deteriorate into anything bad. Okay? So progressive prolongation, you have a warning sign, and then you get a drop beat. What's Mobitz 2? Someone else who has an answer on this over here. It's just the opposite of what we just said. It's a Good, no warning. So you, you don't progressively prolong the PR. You just have a constant PR. Now, usually it's prolonged. So you usually have first degree AV block with Mobitz 2, usually. So it just stays constant, and then all of a sudden you have a P with without a QRS. So that's Mobitz 2. That is a little bit more concerning because it has the potential to deteriorate into worse AV block. So we've kind of gone further down in the AV node. Okay. And then finally, what's third degree AV block, also known as? Complete, yeah, front row. Complete heart block. And complete heart block means, you have to tell me now what it means. Good. So you have sinus rhythm. So keep that in mind. Sinus rhythm and complete heart block can go together. You have sinus rhythm because it's coming from the sinus node. The problem is that the AV, the AV node is not letting anything through. So the sinus node is just firing and depolarizing the atria independently of what's happening in the ventricles. So there's no association between the two. Good. So now let's practice. Name that, well, I won't say rhythm because, well, yeah, name that rhythm. 
I heard it. Yeah, who said that? Yep. Ooh. So if you see here, so when you see these what we call grouped beatings, so you see that they're sort of groups and then pauses, look for a B block. So here I see my first P wave, PRS. Second P wave, PRS. Do you see how that PR got longer there? Third Q wave were even longer, fourth Q wave even longer, and then finally a P wave without a QRS, and then we start all over again. A hint when you're looking at these, sometimes it's confusing. You know that this is a continuous, this is all over time, right? So time marches forward like this. The computer just switches leads every couple of milliseconds, well, every second or so, so that you get multiple leads, but they're all in the same time. So the bottom one is called the rhythm strip. And the rhythm strip is just one lead for the entirety of this ECG. And lead two is really the best place if you're looking for P waves. So I often, when I'm not certain about what the rhythm is, I come down to the bottom where there's always a rhythm strip. And because here I'm not going to switch morphologies and have a hard time finding my P waves as it switches. So, and if you are having trouble, you can ask, you can switch the way that the 12 lead prints and have it print in rhythm strip mode so that every lead is just continuous. And then look at lead two, which is usually going to be the best place. Okay, good. So this is Mobitz 1, second degree AV block, Mobitz 1, also known as Wanky Bach. Next. The people at the VA look so thrilled right now. Just want to point out. <laughs> Where are they? They're not at the VA? They are. Okay, anybody? What is this? Good. I heard that from you right there. So this is complete heart block, third degree. So let's look here, we have both two and B5 both printed out. By the way, when you're looking at the monitor, which leads are they usually displaying on telly? It's usually two and then one of the um, precordials, sometimes V1, sometimes V5. So here we have, okay, first I'm gonna focus on my P waves. P wave, there's a QRS after it, but does that look like a physiologic interval? That's so long. It'd be really hard for the AV node to truly delay that long of conduction and still have this being conducted from the atria to the ventricle. So P wave, P wave, clearly there's nothing after that P wave. P wave, nothing. P wave, okay, does that look like a physiologic PR interval? Sure does. So if you only saw this right here, only that beat, you might be like, oh, it's just a drop beat 2 to 1 AV block. That's why you have to look at the whole thing. So clearly you can march out. The sinus beat, so again, you have sinus rhythm here, and you'll notice that the rate is um, just around uh, 100, because that sinus node likes to go pretty fast, somewhere around 100, right? And then you have ventricular complexes, and they march through independent of the P waves. So there are times, very clearly times like here, for example, where you know that that P wave was not conducted to the QRS. And this is important. I know that you guys know in your mind, P waves and QRS and they're independent of each other. But how many times have you seen an ECG that you thought was complete heart block and you panicked and you showed it to a cardiologist and we're like, eh, it's fine, right? So and you gotta really look hard. The other thing to notice here is that the atrial rate is, fill in the blank, faster or slower than the ventricular rate. Faster. So that is complete heart block. We talked about VT one of the other times, and in VT you similarly have atria and ventricles that are depolarizing at different rates and independently of one another, right? But in VT, the ventricular rate is, fill in the blank, faster or slower than the atrial rate. Faster. So if you have VT, you have what we call AV dissociation, but the V is faster than the A. In complete heart block, you're also dissociated, but here your A is faster than your V. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. And the other thing to notice, remember we were talking about width. So what do you think about the width of this QRS? Is it wide or is it narrow? It's narrow. So where does that suggest that this, so this is a ventricular escape. Well, it's an escape. Meaning that it's like, ah, nothing's coming through the AV node, I better fire. So it has escaped. Where is this impulse originating from? Is it originating from something high up in the ventricle or is it initiating from low in the ventricle? High up, and how do you know that? It's going, down the highway. it's going down the highway, it's narrow. So we call this a junctional escape because it's close to that junction of the AV node and the superhighway. So it's coming from somewhere real close to the node and jumping onto the superhighway and traveling down it, okay? That's as opposed to, and so this is a more stable situation. Your ventricular rate here is somewhere around 50, something 55. 
This is a more stable situation than if you see a wide QRS. Why is that? What did I tell you about? What would a wide QRS here indicate? It would indicate that the impulse is originating from where? High or low in the ventricle? Low, because it doesn't have time to jump on the superhighway and go through that fast conduction. It's going myocyte to myocyte. That's a much less reliable situation than this where you have a nice narrow escape, which is probably somewhere really high up in the his Purkinje system. Okay. Good. This has some arrows to help you out. What does this rhythm strip show? So type 2 of what? Second degree AV block type 2, or Mobitz 2. And how do you know that? Because the PRS is the same. Or the PR interval is the same. PR interval stays exactly the same until you drop. Okay? Quiz. Can you, when you have 2 to 1 block, so 2 A's for every B, can you tell if it's Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2, yes or no? Not reliably. There's some clues, and I'll show you an example later. But if it's 2 to 1 AV block, you can't tell. So you just say 2 to 1 AV block. Okay, great. So treatment, what do we do for these patients who have bradycardia that either have any one of these rhythms as the cause of their bradycardia? So importantly, you should remove or avoid all nodal blockade if this is a nodal problem. So if you have first, second, or third degree AV block and it's causing them to have bradycardia, remove that nodal blockade. Take away your beta blockers, take away your calcium channel blockers. Think about amiodarone, think about how much they need it because it does have some beta blocker activity. Um, and remove that blockade and see if they get a little bit better. So that's sort of your first step, if they are asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic, we'll get there in a second. Okay, these are for asymptomatic or sort of borderline patients. If they are getting hypotensive because of their bradycardia, that's an indication for urgent treatment, which we'll get into second definitive treatment. But in the meantime, you want to support their blood pressure. So you can give these people fluids. You can give these people dopamine to try and increase it. Where does dopamine act in that electrical conduction system? What does it do? So what does dopamine do to your heart rate? Increase or decrease it? Usually increases it. And what rhythm are you usually in with dopamine? Just sinus, right? Sinus tack. So dopamine increases your adrenergic input into your sinus node, and it's going to increase the firing rate, usually, of your sinus node. Now, it can also precipitate arrhythmia. That's a different effect. So dopamine is going to, if you have sinus bradycardia, dopamine will help you, okay? If you have one of your other AV blocks, dopamine doesn't do a fantastic job at helping you at the AV node, but it may. So it's fine to try a little dopamine and see what happens to them, okay? If they really have toxicity from some of their agents, so um, I have seen a patient who uh, we had to float temp wires because of beta blockade. This person was an AFib with RVR, and they were getting slammed and slammed and slammed with nodal blockade. Those of you who've rotated with me know how I feel about stacking nodal agents on top of one another. It's probably because of this guy. He got beta blocker and beta blocker and calcium channel blocker, and nothing was working. So they're giving him more and more and more nodal agents, and then all of a sudden, boom, flips back into sinus. And he actually flips into complete heart block with an escape of 30. Symptomatic, not good. So if you really have toxicity from some of your agents, you can give glucagon to try and reverse your beta blocking. You can give calcium for the calcium channel blockers. Whether that works or not, who really knows? But you can do that acutely as you're trying to do other definitive therapies. And then if they're truly asymptomatic and they're just having over beta blockade or over calcium channel blockade, just give them some time. And as you take those agents away, their heart rate is going to slowly improve, and you'll see them get better. Similar with DIG toxicity. If they're not really, really toxic from the DIG and they're just bradycardic from it, give it some time, let it wash out of the system, they're going to get better. Okay. Now, if they're decompensating and they're really dying or close to dying, you can try atropine. Where does atropine act? Right, so it's going to block your parasympathetic. So atropine, if you're in complete heart block, where the problem is at the AV node, um, the AV node is blocked, so it doesn't care what the parasympathetic input is. So it may or may not work. I've talked to some EPs about this before. They're like, eh, you can go ahead and try it while you're calling us. So you can try atropine if you want, but keep in mind that if it's really complete heart block, it's probably not going to help you. Um, if it's um, sinus bradycardia, you can try the atropine to try and increase the rate from the um, sinus node. Um, and I remember this little adage, if they're alive, give them 0.5. So your code dose of atropine is one milligram, but if they're truly alive and just bit almost dying, then give them 0.5 milligrams first to start, okay? 
You can also give people beta agonists. So dopamine is a beta agonist, which you can give them direct beta agony with isoproteranol. So this is a direct beta agonist that's just going to act on heart rate. Doesn't do a ton for contractility, doesn't do anything to your blood pressure. So this you can try to use if you're going to try to speed up their rate. We use this, we'll come to this later. Does anybody know the situation where we love isoproteranol in, in the CCU, for example? That's a bad question. I asked it badly. I will tell you. So if someone has, sorry? Good, you guys got it. I, did I teach you that? I did. So maybe you already knew it. So if someone is going into torsade, so what, what um, is a risk for torsade? Would, would we look at on the ECG? Prolonged QT. What happens to your QT when you're bradycardic? Does it get greater or less than when you're normal rhythm? So the, the more bradycardic you are, the longer your QT. So if someone is going into torsade because of long QT and bradycardia, you'll see they're like brady, 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 PVC, torsade. So after you shock them, you can float temp wires or transcutaneously pace them because if you shorten their RR interval, you also shorten their QT interval and they're at less risk of going into torsade. So um, we use isopril or isoproteranol in that situation as well in order to try and keep their heart rate up. And then you can do some pacing if they're really symptomatic because of this bradycardia. You can pace them. We're going to talk about how to do that. So this is the Zolbox that everybody is familiar with. You're familiar with this usually because of trying to shock somebody. Has anybody here ever tried to transcutaneously pace someone? Okay, how, how did that go? Um, we had to, let's see, initially we tried side to side to work, anterior posterior, and then had to continue going up on the gain until we eventually got the contact. There you go. And then how long did that last for? Actually, it lasted until the fellow came in and put it up. Uh, Temp wires? Okay, good. How long was that? Like half an hour. Okay. So. There you go. So the point here is this is a very temporary measure to transcutaneously pace someone. You are delivering energy, so it's painful. So remember that you've got to sedate these patients. We'll talk about pad placement. It's very important, but you also need to know how to work this box. So you guys are, this is the off position, and usually if you're going to shock someone in a code, you just turn it up here. So this is going to be your AED or defibrillation mode. When you flip it up, then you can utilize all of these, your Joules energy select, your charge, your clear, your sink over here, etc. In some of the newer models, this green part, which is the pacing part, is not obvious until you turn it down. It lights up. So just because, and there are some boxes that don't have pacing capability. So just make sure when you're looking at the box, if you don't see the green pacing, try turning the dial down. It may light up. In this, this is a newer model. When you turn it down, um, it lights up, and then this little box flips open, and you have your controls for the pacing mode. The two controls you have are the heart rate and then the output, the milliamps, okay? And as you would expect, the more milliamps you give, the more likely it is to be delivered to the myocardium and actually give it the impulse it needs to be paced. So there's no way to know when you flip this open. There's no numbers on these settings. So you don't actually know what the heart rate is or what the output is until you start pacing them. Keep in mind, as soon as you flip this down into pacing mode, it is in pacing mode. So if it does not see a QRS complex, at the rate that it is set, it will start pacing. So there's no like on off. You can't like have it on standby. Once it's in the pacing mode, if it doesn't see a QRS, it will pace. And you can just play with these dials to change the rate, which will appear on the bottom of the screen, and just increase your milliamps until you get to get capture. How do you know that you have capture? What happens on the screen? A pulse, good, okay. They may already have, you know, if they're bradycardic, they're probably gonna have some pulse. So a pulse at the rate you've set, and then? So you'll see a spike, it, it can spike even if it's not capturing. What you want is a spike with a QRS after it. Is that QRS after it going to be narrow or wide? It's going to be wide. You get that for spike. And who said wide? You're getting a lot of candy. Woo! Or are you getting it? <clears throat> um, so it should be a wide QRS. And it's wide because you're just delivering surface electricity. You're no, nowhere near that superhighway. So it's going to be a wide ventricular looking QRS because you're just depolarizing all the myocardium at the same time. But that's enough to get it to contract. So that's how you use this. You use this for transcutaneous pacing. Now, pad placement is super important. When you see the actual pad, they actually show you the optimal pad placement, which is front and back. If I see any of you doing this side to side nonsense, I will kick you in the shins. Actually, I'll pace you, okay, and then see how you like it, side to side. The problem here is it's all about vector. You're delivering a vector of energy between the two pads. 
So if you're delivering the energy from here to here, you might go through the myocardium and catch it, but in a lot of our patients, what are you gonna be pacing? Fat, basically. So if you go front to back, you're gonna have a much better option of actually capturing the heart. So you take the time to roll them over, slap the pat on the back, and roll them back. Similarly, if you're defibrillating or uh, cardioverting someone, I also wanna see this. I don't wanna see the front and side nonsense, even though on the mannequins, when you practice, that's where they're put, okay? Everybody got it? Pad placement, very, very important. It doesn't truthfully matter which one's on the front and which one's on the back. It's nice if you have this one on the front if you're doing chest compression, but in terms of the electrical vector, it doesn't matter which is front and which is back. So that's how you transcutaneously pace someone. That is a temporary measure. So usually what will happen, you start to transcutaneously pace them, you may get some capture, and then you're gonna have to keep going up and up and up on the milliamps because you'll lose capture. Also, it kind of burns their chest, so keep in mind this is a really painful thing. And this is only a temporary measure until you get uh, somebody to come in, one of us, and put in temp wires. And then through the temporary venous pacemaker, we have a lot more uh, control of the situation. Okay, questions about how to transcutaneously pace someone, situations in which you do it? I'm gonna tell you one of the mistakes I made once. So I had a guy who was in AFib with RVR, and he was pretty much hemodynamically unstable from it, but like peri-unstable. So we thought we could maybe get him out of it with just giving him some adenosine. But for whatever reason, probably inexperience, I was worried that when I gave him adenosine, he wasn't going to have a rhythm that came back. I don't remember if he was Brady at baseline or what the case was. So um, whenever you're giving adenosine, you should have pads on someone just in case they don't come back, which happens. People with sick sinus nodes. Sometimes if you give them adenosine and block the AV node, their sinus node just decides to go to sleep, and then you have nothing. So you should have pads on them. What you shouldn't do is what I did, which is I had it on pacing mode just in case, because I was ready to go, okay? But what did I tell you is that when it's on pacing mode, it's going to go. So I gave adenosine, everything blocks, right? So AV node is blocked, the AFib impulses are no longer going through, so he's asystolic for a short period of time. That's what happens when you give adenosine. But the pacing box doesn't know that it's going to wear off in less than six seconds. So we started pacing this fully awake man at 60 or whatever it was. And I'm like, wait, what? The, what? Uh, what? Okay, let's just turn that pacer box off and just have it there on standby. So I don't want to see any of you guys doing that. You learn from my mistake. All right, that's pacing. Okay, so now we're going to do a time of ECG practice. This may or may not be uh, Brady arrhythmias. It's just going to be practice of how to... Um, go through ECGs, okay? Everybody ready? Candy is to be had. And these are all cases gathered from uh, my mentor and his favorite cases. So a young man has staph aureus aortic valve endocarditis. IV drugs are bad for you, in case you didn't know that. So somebody tell me, what is the rhythm on this ECG? You're looking hard, too hard. What's the rhythm? It's sinus, good. And what's your PR interval? It's just around, who said sinus? I don't know. I just want to throw some candy at some people. You guys over here, are not talking very much. You guys get some candy. Uh, okay, this is sinus, but the PR interval is just slightly prolonged. Oops. Slightly prolonged. It's about 217. So you might look at it, you know, 200 milliseconds is one box. But if you actually look where the PR begins, it's like just before. Okay, so just over 200. Why do you check... Why should you check an ECG every day in someone who has aortic valve endocarditis? And what are you looking for on the ECG? Good, and why? Good, that was like so not close to you. That was as close to you as the, this is to the AV node. Okay, so the aortic valve in the anatomy of the heart, remember what I showed you at the beginning? The AV node is actually really close to the aortic valve. So what happens when you have aortic valve endocarditis? Not only can the cusps be infected, but you know what else can happen? You can get an abscess around the ring of the aortic valve itself. And if you get an abscess, it's going to grow out and push, and it can push against the AV node. So sometimes the only sign you have of an aortic valve abscess, which, by the way, is a need for urgent surgery, is that your, a your PR interval starts to prolong as the AV node gets kind of crushed and you increase the PR interval. So every single day you should be looking at the PR interval. Okay, so because we should, we're looking at it. So two days later, what do you have now here? Yeah, so can you see a P wave? Not really, it's hard for me to find. Now I can maybe convince you if I look at this T wave, so power of comparison is wonderful. So if I look at this T wave here, and now I look at this T wave, they look different, right? 
it looks like this is heaped up, so maybe my P wave is buried in the T wave. And in fact, it is. I don't know who said that, but someone gets some candy. So this is a really prolonged PR interval. It's so far that it's basically disappeared. So we've got a huge, so this should prompt basically a TEE in order to figure out if they've got an abscess. So it's two days later, so this has probably gotten at three in the morning in the CCU. And then two hours later when you're on rounds, patient's not doing so hot. You look up at the monitor you're like, that looks funny. So then you print a 12 lead and here's what you see. And what is it that you see here? Louder? Good. So here's complete heart block. So P, P, let's go down here. P, 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 buried, P, P, P. Okay, independently on top of one another. This is a really powerful thing. When you see that right there, you really have a clue. Can this be conducted? No. You, you can't have a PR interval that long unless you have a pacemaker that's purposely waiting to see if the ventricle is going to depolarize, and you've set it to be a really long AV delay. So this is completely a hard block. Okay, bad news for space station. Um, is his escape rhythm coming from where in the ventricle, high or low? Hi, good. I saw that you, you motioned high. It's coming from high to the ventricle, and you know that because this is a narrow. So it's a narrow junctional escape is what we call it. Okay? Then, a few hours later, after that, now what is the difference? What happened here? You're still in complete heart block. I'll give you that. P, 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 P. But what's happened to your QRS now? It's wide, so that means what? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Good, disaster preparedness. I'm all about that. Okay. So that means that instead of having an escape coming from high up in the junction, is coming from further down. And I told you that's a less stable situation. So you can see that his ventricular rate here is still around 50. So it's not that he's really that slow, but when you see it deteriorating like this, you're worried that it's going to deteriorate further. So what ended up happening is, he gets a temporary pacemaker put in right then because we need to prevent him from going to a ventricular escape of 30 and no longer perfusing. So we float some temp wires. You can tell that he's now paced. You have this wide QRS with a spike in front of it that shows you that he's being ventricularly paced from the RV. And we got a TEE that showed a huge valve ring abscess, which buys him a trip to the OR. I'm going to tell you a story that's going to frighten you. So I had a patient who had, um, I think it was staph aureus endocarditis of his uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve. Really nice man in his 60s. And unfortunately, he'd had one of the dreaded complications. He had a piece of the endocarditis fly up into his brain and give him a stroke, a small one, but he had hemorrhage around it. So once you have hemorrhage around the stroke in the brain, you can't go and get your valve replaced for six weeks because you know what happens when we put you on bypass? We give you a boatload of heparin, like more than any person should see in their life. And if we give you all that and you bleed into your brain, who cares if we fixed your valve? So he was in the CCU just waiting to get his valve replaced. And dutifully, every day we would check an ECG and look at his PR interval to make sure he wasn't developing a valve ring abscess. One day on round, this is when I was a resident, the fellow said, what if he develops an abscess on the other side of his aortic valve? Not near the, not near the AV node. And we were all like, yeah, that won't happen. The next day, I'm the only, I was actually an intern, and I was the only physician in September of my intern year in the CCU. Some of you already know this story. I'm sitting there waiting, and all of a sudden, the nurse brings me this ECG. She's like, room 24 is having chest pain. It's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. There was basically ST depression everywhere and AVR was up. I've taught you, what does that mean? If AVR is up and there's ST depression everywhere else? It means global ischemia disaster for space station. And so I, I, first thing I did was call the fellow. Any of you guys know Brad Sutton from EP here? So he was my fellow. So I said, call the fellow, and I went in the room and the patient is breathing 50 times a minute. He is desaturating, he's getting hypotensive, he's dying right in front of my eyes. So I'm like, oh, we're going to make you feel better, sir. So lights and sirens and everybody comes and we tube him and we line him and we do a TE. And he had ruptured his ventricular septum because instead of eating out, the valve ring abscess ate down. And it ate down into his interventricular septum and he ruptured it and he died right then and there. So you check the PR interval, but that's not the whole story. Good. You're all scared now. You should be. Okay. Let's move on to some happier tales. This is an old man who comes in with syncope. What is the rhythm? It's a little hard to see, but just look at it from afar and characterize this. So 
So how would you describe it? If you can't see what the rhythm is, how would you describe this? Narrow, complex, and what did you say? Yeah, there you go. So what does that mean? It's AFib. So you see some little squirrely, 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 but there's no organized atrial activity. So this is slow atrial fibrillation, which happens for older people who have kind of fibrosed conduction system, and if their AV node doesn't conduct quickly, you can get slow AFib. So this is slow AFib. Then he gets a carotid massage for kicks. What do you see here? QRF. QRF. Yeah. Okay, so you give him carotid massage, you increase his vagal tone, and his AV node goes completely to sleep. So this is what we know as carotid hypersensitivity. Okay, and that was the uh, etiology for his syncope. I believe he ended up getting a pacemaker. Well, that's a cool one for interest. Okay, here is a pediatric intern who has a rash. I'm going to tell you, to, this is a little bit hard to see because the volts are low. I'm going to tell you to focus right here. And what do you see? Very long PR, so first degree AV block for sure. So we've that. Oh, you're getting all the candy today. Oh, cool, sorry. <laughs> and by you, I mean you. You get it. Okay. So very long PR, and then you notice that there's grouped beating, right? So here's three beats, here's two beats. So when you see grouped beating, you look for block. So if we're looking for block, look right here and see, do you think that the PR is getting progressively longer, or is it staying the same? Yeah, it's a little bit hard to tell, but it is staying the same. So this is Mobitz 1, and there's a dropped P wave where it's kind of buried there. So this is Mobitz 1 from Lyme disease, okay? And that Lyme disease is well known to affect your conduction system. No emergency to this. It's going to get better once you treat him with some ceftriaxone, and then he's going to get better. Or she. Okay, now we get some fun. So an older woman walks into a cardiology clinic for a pre-op evaluation, and this is what you get on your 12-lead ECG. So again here, I'm going to say focus on the rhythm strip on the bottom. What do you have? Q. Yeah. So here's P, P, QRS, P, P, QRS, P, P, QRS. So this is 2 to 1 AD block. Now, I told you that you can't figure out if it's Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2. There's a few clues on here that make us think that this is probably Mobitz 2. The clues are... Um, that you have a right bundle branch block pattern. So that suggests intrinsic conduction system disease and suggests that it's lower down in the node. And then your PR interval is actually really short. And so, um, sorry, that's not it. The distance between here and then the next QRF is pretty slow. So if this were really getting progressively longer, you would expect that this delay would be much more. It's, those are sort of advanced electrophysiological principles, and it's really fine if you just say two to one. But when we saw this, we think this is probably Mobitz two. Okay. Now, in her case, the point of this lecture is not to teach you about indications for uh, permanent pacemakers, but in her case, because she has a, a, a slow ventricular escape, and again, it's wide, so it's coming from lower in the ventricle, and it's pretty slow. Um, does anybody know the intrinsic rate that a ventricular escape rhythm likes to go at? Yeah, so it depends on where it is. So the lower it is, somewhere around 30 is pretty low. The junction will be happy around 40, even maybe sometimes 50. Um, but the fact that this is pretty slow at 40 with likely Mobix 2 plus right bundle, that's enough conduction system disease that she buys herself a pacemaker, even though she's asymptomatic. Okay, so, but again, I don't want you to worry about pacemaker indication. Okay, this one is hard to see, but this is an army reservist who's got some gastroenteritis and has recurrent syncope. So what do you see here? And I'm going to have you focus on, okay, so right here, what's going on right there? Three P waves with no QRSs, okay, so that gives you a hint. We've got some sort of AV block going on. And then if you try to march through P waves here, you can kind of see there's some degree of P waves. So what would you call this? So we would just call it high-grade AP block because it's a little bit hard to tell because the P's are so buried if it's really prolonging or not. So clearly you have um, a P wave here with a long PR interval, a P wave with a long PR interval, another P wave buried, long PR, P wave drop, 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 drop. So this is high-grade AP block. It's not quite complete heart block, but you're very worried about the ability of this P wave to conduct down to this QRS. And then your, um, uh, what does your QRS look like? Is it wide or narrow? 
It's why so that's also pretty concerning. Um, so then this person syncopizes. I love this one. What do you see? How many QRSs are on this ECG? I see exactly one. Okay. How many P waves are there? A lot. So basically, again, this is two separate systems. So the sinus node is firing, 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 and the AV node is like, yeah, that's nice, thanks, it's great. And only it only lets through one um, complex to go and depolarize the ventricle. So this guy obviously gets a pacemaker, but I think that's pretty cool. You can see how his sinus node is firing. So he is in sinus rhythm, but it doesn't matter if the sinus node is firing if it doesn't go down through your AV node and into the ventricle. Okay, so he probably had um, myocarditis, he had gastroenteritis, he probably had some virus that affected the conduction system, um, and um, actually he got temp wires to get better. And after the temp wires, and then he's getting, he's improving, and eventually his conduction um, uh, came back, which is pretty cool. Uh, all right, a seven-year-old woman walks into your clinic just for a routine visit, and she maybe has some risk factors for heart disease, so you get an ECG. What do you see here? If you're not sure, again, look at the rhythm strip down here. So what's your ratio of P waves to QRSs? Yeah, so there's two to one, right? This is clearly conducted, not conducted. Conducted, not. Conducted, not. So two to one AV block. It may or may, or may not be, have one or two. That's for our nobody. <laughs> Someone can scatter the back So two to one AV block, what do you do for her? Asymptomatic, what's her ventricular rate here? Oh, there's no line. That looks like it's somewhere in the 50 range, right? So she has a pretty good ventricular escape rhythm. So um, you do nothing for her because she's feeling fine. Two to one AV block, no other conduction system disease, narrow QRS, heart rate of 50, asymptomatic, have a nice day. You want to see her back, but you don't need to do anything then. Okay, six months later, she comes back to clinic for her routine visit. She's still feeling fine, asymptomatic. What do you have here? Anyone? Okay, so, how, do you have more P's or more QRS's? More P's, good. And then, do you think there is a relationship between, say, this and this? No. So this is complete heart block. Now, she has a junctional escape, right? It's narrow, but it is pretty slow. So her junction, usually you'll see it around 40 or 50. This is pretty slow. It's less than 40. So because she has a very slow junctional escape, that's going to meet pacemaker criteria in some circles. So now the question is, do you want to, she's asymptomatic. She's feeling fine, but she's in complete heart block. You know she needs a pacemaker because her escape rate is around 38. Do you want to send her into the hospital today, or do you want to get her to see and have EP do it um, next Monday? Why? Because you feel nervous with a heart rate of 38. Woo! I really like to throw behind you. You need to get a little taller for next time. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so you want to do it today, and I think that you know there would be some debate about this. She's asymptomatic, but she gets admitted to a hospital to a monitored bed because they want to do it today. That's a slow junctional escape, something to be worried about. So she's admitted to a monitored bed and this can happen. So you're really happy you didn't send her home. So what happened here? Okay, it's hard to tell, but here's a, here's a P and a QRS that may or may not have a relationship. And then here you get a PVC. And then, what's that rhythm called? That is for thought. So because she was so bradycardic, her QT is long. So she's at risk for torsade to point after she has a PVC, and that exactly happens. She goes into torsade. How do you treat this? What do you do immediately? You get called to the bedside? Good. Someone gets that. Shock them. They get shocked, and then? You can use isopro to increase the heart rate. Magnesium, right? We usually do that to try and, if there's any uh, contribution of hypomagnesemia. Um, or you can give her temp wires. So any of, any of the above should happen. What does that mean? So everybody's really glad we admitted her to the hospital. Okay. So she gets a temp wire, and again, here you see that she has 
a spike and she has a very wide QRS because all the, the pacer just sits in the RV and it just goes. It doesn't care about anything else. You can change some of the settings on it, but it goes. So it's pacing her from the RV, so you're going to be wide because you're not on the superhighway. You're just pacing from myocyte to myocyte, so you get this wide depolarization. And um, good, okay. Next case, this is just an ECG. What is this? We're just doing all kinds of ECG practice. What is this? Rhythm. AFib, who said that? AFib with RVR, right? Whoop. And what else do you see on this ECG that's of concern to you? Yeah, this looks like an ischemic ECG, right? I'm going to stop throwing it to you. Um, so they've got lots and lots of ST depression in <clears throat> many places, which may be a stress test, right? Heart rate goes up, STs go down, or maybe that they're having an end semi with AFib. How, how often is AFib an ischemic rhythm? Not very, right? So I don't usually think that the AFib is a sign of ischemia, but here the AFib may be causing ischemia because you go fast, you've got a fixed coronary stenosis, your demand goes up, you can't get your blood down. We've talked about that a lot. So this is AFib with RBR and ischemia. What is this? Good, everyone said it so no one gets candy. And how, um, what is your um, conduction from your A to your B? It's about four to one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It's about four to one conduction. This is classic sawtooth pattern. This is classic, typical atrial flutter. With a right bundle branch block underlying. Okay, good. All right, these are fun. This is a middle-aged woman who's having palpitations. What is this rhythm? So if you don't know the actual rhythm, you can start by describing it. So how would you describe this? Narrow complex, regular or irregular? Narrow complex, regular tachycardia, okay? So then what's your next thing that you do? If that's on your, what, you have a differential for a regular narrow tachycardia. So next thing you do is look for P waves and see if you can find any. Good, exactly. So for the non-cardiology bound people in the room, what's that mean? So you look to see can you find any P waves? And where you find P waves can impact what your differential is. So does anybody see P waves here? I do, but that's because I'm a trained professional. Good. So this little divot right here. Does everybody see how in V1 you have this upstroke? Think about what you normally see in V1. Do you normally see that upstroke in the absence of a right bundle branch block? No. You don't normally, normally it's just a fully negative uh, deflection or maybe a little positive R wave here and then down. So you very rarely see that. And then also look at V2. Do you normally see this um, S wave in V2, normally it's just going to be upright. Okay? So those are signs in 2 and V1, and this is what we call a retrograde P wave. It's retrograde because the impulse is coming back around the AV node and going back up to the atria. So it is depolarizing the atria, but in the opposite direction, so it's negative instead of being positive in V2. And sometimes you really can't tell on this ECG, so you might call this a narrow complex regular tachycardia and you'd have a differential for that. Um, but if you had the baseline ECG, you'd be able to compare and look at the morphology, specifically of 2 and V1, and you would see. So this lady, um, it is ABNRT, and when you give her an ABNRT ablation, look at what happened here in lead 2. So there's no little um, S wave. And, I'm oh, sorry, uh, and there's no R prime in V1. So if you have her baseline ECG and you could see when she's in sinus, she doesn't have those, and then she flips into this arrhythmia and I find these retrograde P waves, then you feel confident that it's ABNRT. Okay? And what we're talking about with short RP, so here's the R and here's the P. In a lot of these narrow complex tachycardias, you're looking to see the distance, not the PR, but the RP. And if it's short versus if it's long, it changes what your differential is. But most of the time, when you guys say SVT, so what does SVT mean? Nothing at all. Just means that it's coming from above the ventricle, but there's so many things that it could be. So when you guys usually are thinking of a narrow, regular, complex tachycardia that you can't find P waves for, most of the time that's going to be AVNRT. So now sometimes maybe it's not AVNRT. So this is a person who has new onset of heart failure, found to have a dilated ventricle. The heart rate is always 139. So those of you who rotated with me when we're looking at tachycardias, you know how much I like to see onset, offset, and then what's their pattern like. Do they slowly rev up? Do they go booming into the arrhythmia? Is it always at the same rate? Is it or is it not? Okay. So this heart rate is persistent at 139. Now, can anybody find P waves 
in this tray thing? Sure you can. Anybody want to tell me what lead? Yeah, so look at lead three. Look at this right here. Does that look like a T wave to you? There's a there's a T or S T segment there, right? But then there's something extra. Okay, so that looks like maybe that's a P wave. Looks a little funny. I'm going to travel up here to two. I know what my P wave should look like in two, and this does not look like its normal P wave in lead two. And then here in V1, similarly, I can find this divot in V2. Okay, that looks like a P wave. Follow it up. And I see this here in V1 also doesn't look like a normal P wave in V1. So that suggests that I have a P wave, but it's not normal morphology. So it's probably coming from somewhere else inside the atria. This is atrial tap. The fact that it goes at one rate consistently is also helpful. Because if it's sinus tack, for example, sinus tack changes rates. It goes all over the place because the sinus node has all of your parasympathetic, sympathetic inputs. But atrial tack is coming from an automatic spot in the atria, and it just goes at its own intrinsic rate. So this is an actual atrial tack. And this is what we call a long RT tachycardia because the distance from the R to the P is long as compared to the last time when it was really short. So the cool thing is, that you ablate the ATAC. Now, oh, that looks much more like the P wave that I'm used to seeing in V2 and in V1, and LV function actually recovered. So this was a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. Good not to miss that. Okay, how are we doing on time? A couple more, couple more? Okay. Um, they're not always, but they can be. And I look for that. So if I find someone who has an idiopathic cardiomyopathy and their heart rate's always 130, I go looking for an A tach, uh, an A flutter with slow conduction or some sort of tachyarrhythmia that might be the cause of it, especially if their heart rate is always the same. If you have a high heart rate because of a bad cardiomyopathy, it's going to be sinus tach, so it should change the rate. But if it's always spot on at one thing, that suggests automaticity. So I go looking for it. Okay, this one's fun. This is a post-op uh, woman. She's 45. You get called from the PACU because she's had a cardiac health. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So you get an ECG. First of all, this doesn't look good, right? This looks ischemic, but never mind. Maybe it's ischemic because of the rate. So let's figure out what our rhythm is. Okay, why do you think it's flutter? I see a patient with gradually marching Okay, so you see some P waves here. I agree with you that I see P waves. Do you really see convincing sawtooth P waves in the inferior leads? I don't either, but I'm searching for them. So I'm thinking, well, maybe is that a P? Is that the end of the T? Something looks here, but I do see some organized atrial activity. So I don't think that this is AVNRT, although it could be. I've got that little S here and the R prime here, so it could be AVNRT. So um, it's a long RT tachycardia, my R to my P, but I still don't know what it is. So we can have our valve salva and give her a little vagal input and see what I can do. So what happens? Slow down the ventricular rate and that allows me to see P wave. This is just sinus tachycardia. Then you look like a hero. Please don't shock that person. For sinus tachycardia. <laughs> and lo and behold, now that the rate is slower, all those ST changes went away. So those were rate related. Okay, cool. Okay, a few more for fun. Woo! This is a good one. All right, so graduate student at where I, where I train. Graduate student uh, is downtown. Face plants, just gone completely. Now when it's called and they hook them up and this is a rhythm strip that they get. And then, bam, they get a little shock here and go to this. So, if you know, don't say, but I want everybody to look at this. So, fast or slow. You're laughing, but you have to go through the algorithm unless you already know what this is, which I do because I've seen this before, but you might not. Okay, so you're presented with this. Your first thought is what? What do you first think this is? First looking at it. You're the AMBO. You're EMS. The guy is dead with this. What do you think it is? Huh? You think it's VT, right? I hope someone's thinking that. That's the first thing you're thinking the first time you hook up the monitor and see this wide, complex, very fast tachycardia, 300 beats per minute, that's fast as, okay? So you're thinking it's a VT and you shock him. That's fine. It's good to shock somebody that you think is VT. But now let's take a step back now that he's alive again and see what we find. So fast or slow? Fast. Wide or narrow? It's, it's wide. It's narrow-ish, but it's, it's wide. Look right here. Okay? It's wide. <laughs> and then regular or irregular? 
It is irregular. Do you see that? It is not always the same. Maybe if you only had this part right here, you might think that it's regular. But up here, even in this, that is changing cycle length a little bit. Look, this is different than this. So this is a wide, complex, irregular tachycardia in a young person who died and gets brought back to life. Okay? So before I tell you the answer, you should have in your mind what that, what that is. He appropriately gets shocked. This needs to be shocked. Don't spend time trying to figure out what it is. He's dead and he gets shocked. But then you get, so this is actually AFib, okay? It's AFib that's going fast. Then you get this ECG when he arrived from the ED. And again, I don't want any of my cardiology bound residents to say what this is. Does anybody else see something abnormal on here? Look at the QRS. Is this a normal QRS complex? What's abnormal? Exactly. So do you see how it is slurred? Normally, when you get on that superhighway, boom, it all happens at the same time. This is a slurred upstroke. That's what we call a delta wave because it looks like a triangle. This is called pre-excitation. This is WPW, and this is what people with WPW die. So WPW, your AV node, these are healthy young people, so your AV node can conduct as fast as you want. You saw here, his AV node is getting impulses from above, and they're sometimes at 300 beats a minute, and the node is like, it's cool, I got it, I can handle that. So the AV node lets all of those impulses through. The reason that you have this slur is because not all the electricity is going through the AV node. You have an accessory pathway, usually out, let's say, somewhere in the left ventricle, out here. That accessory pathway allows, usually all the electrical activity that happens in the atria has to funnel through the AV node to get down to the ventricle. The accessory pathway is a little shortcut. It's like a back door when the freeway is clogged. So electrical impulse from the atria can also travel down the accessory pathway plus the AV node. But the accessory pathway is not nodal tissue, it's muscle. So if it's not nodal tissue and it's muscle, does it conduct fast or slower than the AV node? Slower because it's muscle. And also when it goes through there, it has to come back and join the superhighway. So this part of the depolarization that's happening because of the accessory pathway is slower and not going on the superhighway, and so that's what causes this widening of the QRS. So this slurred upstroke represents electrical impulse coming through the accessory pathway and back over to join the superhighway. So we call it pre-excitation, and the reason why people with WPW die is not because of VT, it's because they go into AFib with RVR. Normally, if I don't have an accessory pathway, I think, so if I go into AFib with RVR, my node can conduct, um, well, okay, I, I take back what I said earlier, my node can't conduct at 300. My node can probably conduct up to maybe 220, maybe, I think my node's pretty healthy. Okay, so it can conduct that way, but it's going to slow it down to some extent. When I have an accessory pathway, depending on the pathway, it doesn't slow conduction at all. So it can go as fast as whatever AFib gives it. So that is why you can conduct at 300 here in WPW, because the accessory pathway has no limits. It's no speed limit on that highway. So then you get all the AFib, every single impulse, going down to the ventricle. The ventricle cannot handle all of that, and it goes into AFib, it gets VFib, and they die. So... That's why you learn that if someone has this kind of an ECG, and you know it, and you know that they have pre-excitation, and they come in with this tachycardia, there is one drug that you absolutely should not give them. And what is that? Why not? It's exactly right. So you block the AV node completely, so whatever function the AV node was doing to slow all that AFib is gone, and they're on the Audubon with no speed limit, and then all of the impulses are going down the AV node and then you can kill them. So that's why no adenosine for someone with a pathway that can conduct this fast. Woo, I love this stuff, this is awesome. You can really easily cure this person and save their life. Okay, good. Um, okay, one more because this is so fun. What is happening here? This is a guy, middle age, came in with an MI, on telly, doing fine. This rhythm strip happens. He's awake. You come rushing in the room. He's looking at you like, why are you looking at me like that? So, what do you think this is? <laughs> Some people have probably seen something like this before. So this looks like he's having uh, polymorphic PT, or torsad, something bad. But he's looking at you. So before you go and shock this, take stock, okay? So if you try to find, what is this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, especially here, this, and this, and this. This guy's brushing his teeth. 
And so one of the limb leaves is on his arm. So he's brushing his teeth at approximately 300 times per second. <laughs> okay. And so this is just artifact. You can see the QRS marching through. We see this in people with Parkinson's and tremors, other things that can happen. Okay. I had one guy, a young kid, that really wanted to, he had some Munchausen stuff going on. So he would fall face down on the bed and pretend to pass out, and then he would wave his ECG like this so that it looked like he was having VT. That was really messed up. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so to summarize, for Brady arrhythmias, which is how we started this lecture, your aspiration should be, I hear the call to do nothing, and I'm doing my best to answer it. If they're not symptomatic, do nothing but think. Don't panic. And sometimes the best treatment is no treatment at all. All right, any questions? Great, thanks, guys.